Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'm venturing into some dangerous territory. I'll start recording brief videos on Michel Foucault, and I just realized that even though I have a video in Urdu on discourse as a concept, and even though I've often used it in my discussions of different theories and materials, I've never really recorded a video on discourse. So I thought I'll start with that. Now, please do keep in mind that this is just a cursory explanation of it and not a very deep engagement with the concept. I might do that in a, at a later stage, but just a basic understanding of discourse a la Michel Foucault. Now, one of the books in which Foucault clearly discusses discourse itself is The Archaeology of Knowledge, and I highly recommend that you read it. And what I've gleaned from it as I read it many years ago, here are some of the things about discourse, right? Discourse constitutes a body of knowledge, experts who claim expertise in that knowledge. Mostly it talks about scientific discourses, right? Institutions that lend prestige to a given body of knowledge or a given discourse, right? And these can be state institutions, these can be private entities, but these are the institutions that give someone the right to speak within a given scientific discourse. And those who speak within a given scientific discourse is what Foucault calls the enunciating subjects. Since discourse depends so much on scientific knowledge, its perpetuation, its production, then it automatically does one important thing. It generates its own objects of study, right? So this is this circular movement, there's a scientific body of knowledge, there are practitioners of it, there are people who read it, people who believe in it, people who must do research in it. So it constantly then keeps producing newer and newer objects of study. Now, how to simplify this, right? Think about uh, psychology, right? If you have a child who is troubled, you you get a note from the teacher that your child is being disruptive. And you're walking in the garden in a park and someone points to you and says your child is, has ADD. And you're like, who are you to label my child, right? But if you take the same child to a psychiatrist and they write it on a piece of paper and say your child has ADD, chances are you'll believe it. You'll probably ask for a second opinion. But the reason you believe it is that within the discourse of psychology, that person is an enunciating subject and hence has the privilege and power to designate someone as having ADD and you believe that. You don't even have to consciously think about it because you are in that discursive position. Now, one thing to keep in mind in any given discourse is that the idea of top and bottom kind of falls out. Okay, there is no single person sitting at the top initiating a discourse. So people who do colonial discourse analysis or discourse analysis and assume these layers of authority, they're actually not necessarily following Foucault, right? Discourse, Foucault gives us certain characteristics of it, right? It is material. What does he mean by it? It is material because it has material implications. It shapes human bodies, human spirits, forces us to do things or makes us do things in the world. That's why it is material and it courses through the body politic. How does it make us do things, right? Think about a job interview. You have a job interview with a corporation or even with a university. If you're a man, let's say in America, there is a certain way you will dress without them telling you. If you're a woman, you'll dress a certain way. 
without them insisting that you should dress properly. Why are you doing that? Because you are within a discursive space where you already have internalized the logic of that discourse and what kind of identity to perform. So the discourse of corporate job search, the discourse of corporations, right, has already told you how to dress. It's even deeper than that, right? The way we respond to each other, the way the facial expressions are in our faces, on our faces. I always point out to my students in my classes that the classroom discourse, they've so deeply internalized it that even the expressions on their faces when the professor speaks are discursively produced. So what do we mean when we say something is discursive or discursively produced? It can be an action, a text, a performance that is over-determined by a discourse within which you exist, right? And that is why in early Foucault and even in late Foucault, there is nothing outside of discourse. Everything is discursively produced. There is a body of knowledge. There are people who enunciate things, people who are objects of study, institutions that lend prestige to people to become enunciating subjects. But none of them individually constitutes a discourse, right? They are all a part of it. Power runs through it. I'll do a separate brief lecture on Foucault's theory of power. So by discursive then, what we mean is that most of the times things we do or things we see or perform or even interpret are discursively produced because we look at things while being in a certain discourse, right? And that discourse has constructed our consciousness. So what are the implications of this if we buy into this idea that we are always in a given discourse? I mean, first thing that it completely destroys is the idea of that centered human subject. This idea that me, myself, come up with my own decisions, in, am in control of them and determine what I do. That idea is decentered because you suddenly realize that so much of what we do is constituted through the discourse that we are in, even the most private acts, like giving flowers to your beloved or to your wife on Valentine's Day. Do you think you came up with it? No, that is within the discourse of romance, corporatized romance, that the way we express ourselves, even when we reach out to hold the hand of our partners, even that is discursively produced. So by and large, after you have read Archaeology of Knowledge, which gives a detailed account of scientific discourses, what we learn is that there, are, there can be different discourses. We step from one to another. And most of the times in any given discourse, we anticipate we already have internalized its logic and we perform our identity through it. And then discourses themselves go and create their own objects of study, right? The discourse of discipline, punishment, criminology goes and finds people that can be called criminals, that can be defined. Foucault will have a whole discussion about how the figure of the deviant was defined within a moral discourse. If you are in India, Pakistan, elsewhere, the discourse of gender defines how women ought to behave, right? There is no natural way in which women ought to behave, but a certain expectation of them, how should they dress, how should they conduct themselves in pu public, that is a gendered discourse. So the most important thing to keep in mind while thinking about discourse, besides what are its constituent elements is to not worry about any top point from which it, which it emanates, because even those at the top are also determined by other discourses. I mean, think of the president of the United States. He's probably the most powerful person in the world, right? But at the end of the day, if he's a Democrat, there is a certain discourse of liberalism, progressivism within which his actions are determined. Right? And he responds to those p 
political imperatives with certain vocabularies, with certain statements, right? Conservatives do the same. There is no single element in the discourse of conservatism or discourse of progressivism that determines what to say or what is acceptable, right? There is a conglomeration of different instances, different things that inform that discourse. A lot of people have also asked me what's the difference between discourse and ideology. Uh, to be very succinct on that topic, a discourse can have several ideologies, right? It can subsume different kinds of ideologies. It, in a way, can constitute a larger symbolic logic, right? And that's roughly what I can hazard an opinion on. But overall, discourse is constituted by a body of scientific knowledge which has its practitioners, which produce a body of work which people believe in, which is disseminated, perpetuated, right? It has journals, conferences, organizations that believe in that. It has material impacts because it forces us to conduct a certain kind of subjectivity in the world. And if you want to read a really brilliant example of someone using the theory of discourse and writing a book with it, I highly recommend Edward Said's Orientalism, which actually was the first major book, in my opinion, that relied on Foucault's theory of discourse to actually make an argument and suggest that Orientalism itself was a larger discourse, which can be traced over 300 years. Right. So that's all I have to say. I hope this clarifies a little bit. I'll post a link to the order of things in the description. Please do read it when you have some time. And, you know, if you have any questions that I can answer, post them in the comments. And I'll try to now, over time, build a sort of a playlist on Foucault and some of his major concepts and ideas. That's all. Thank you so much. Please stay safe, take care, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.